This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So, having run a chemistry channel for nearly two years now, I have done a ton of interesting projects about many different and unique aspects of chemistry, ranging from synthesizing a literal molecular cube to making a banned weapon from chickens. Over the course of those two years, I went from being quite new to chemistry to making it a major part of my life and improved on many things in my videos, from the editing and camera work to my AI sounding voice. One thing I haven't improved on, however, is my ability to do any kind of conventional art like drawing or painting, which I always wanted to do and include in my videos, and this makes me kind of sad. That's why I recently decided to start getting more creative and learn how to paint, since apart from it obviously being really cool, it would be nice to make some chemistry-related art that doesn't look like a monkey painted it. To make such art, I can of course just buy everything I need and start practicing, however this just doesn't sit right with me. I always like to make stuff myself, and right as I decided to get into painting, I started to wonder what part of it can be made by a moderately advanced chemist. Things like brushes or backgrounds are obviously out of the question, but paint, which is like the main thing about painting, seems to have a ton in common with chemistry. The color of every paint is dictated by what chemicals are in it, and I actually made some colorful reagents before, like the beautiful pigment manganese violet or something called basic copper carbonate. These things however didn't work too well as actual paints and to me never felt quite right, so that's why in this video I decided to make some real and hopefully useful paint through the power of chemistry. One issue though was that I didn't really know what pigment I should make, since there are like thousands of them, each deserving its own video. The answer to this question unexpectedly came to me when one day I decided to get nostalgic and play some Minecraft. In this game there are several types of beautifully colored items, but the one that always stood out to me was something called lapis lazuli. This weird name is actually real and not just some video game gibberish. In real life lapis lazuli is a semi-rare gemstone with a brilliant blue color. While in Minecraft it is used to give enchantments to equipment, in our world it has a rich and interesting history as a blue dye known since ancient times. It was used by many artists and craftsmen to create beautiful pieces of art, and because of the extreme difficulty of producing high quality lapis lazuli pigment, it was as expensive as gold. Now, a question you might be asking yourself is how on earth could some Polish shed chemist make a precious gemstone that usually forms over thousands of years deep underground? Well, lapis lazuli, or more specifically ultramarine, which is the official name of the pigment produced from it, turns out to be weirdly easy to make, at least according to many scientific papers. After learning about this I got really excited, and this dream of making my own ultramarine sent me down a gigantic rabbit hole of failures and misery, and before showing you this whole journey, I really want to tell you about this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an advanced all-in-one website creation platform made to allow entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Using it you can create incredible websites with ease whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand and use them to promote your business or sell anything from normal products to your time. Squarespace provides you with powerful features like their brand new design intelligence, which combines two decades of industry-leading expertise with cutting-edge AI technology to unlock your strongest creative potential and make your website tailored to your personal needs. Additionally, Squarespace gives you access to their email campaigns that are everything you need to easily engage with your subscribers and drive sales, which along with Squarespace's new option for creating and selling your own online courses, can grow your business like never before. For a free trial, head to squarespace.com, and when you're ready to launch, check out squarespace.com slash amateurchemistry to save 10% off your first purchase. Anyway, before starting to make a gemstone in my shed, I first have to figure out exactly what lapis lazuli is made of, and after reading a few papers and spending like 3 hours on Wikipedia, I now have quite a good understanding of what this cool rock really is. First, when it comes to the correct names for all its derivatives, lapis lazuli is the name of the thing you can dig out of the ground, and as you can see in this little sample, apart from the blue part, it also contains some colorless inclusions, as well as those little golden spots made out of something called fool's gold or pyrite. 
The blue part of this rock itself is a mineral called lazurite and it's the thing that has to be separated from all the impurities in order to make it into a pigment. The final pigment is the previously mentioned ultramarine and when it comes to the reason why it has a stunning blue color, it's surprisingly complicated. You see, in most minerals and things like my homemade manganese violet, the color comes from a metal ion surrounded by various other chemicals, which in this case is manganese bound to ammonium and phosphate ligands. In the case of ultramarine, however, its color comes from the so-called trisulfur ion, which is a very unusual and unstable form of sulfur that just so happens to have a blue color. The thing that stabilizes it and makes it relatively resistant to things like air or moisture is a very complex network of literal molecular cages composed of oxygen, sodium, silicon and aluminum. This means that if I want to make some ultramarine, I have to somehow create such delicate molecular structures and imprison some angry sulfur species in them, which when put that way seems like quite the challenge. In reality, however, it really isn't, at least based on all the papers I read, and the ingredients needed to make synthetic ultramarine are only a little more complex than those used to bake a cake. First up, I of course need some sulfur to later turn it into the blue trisulfur ions, and since sulfur is dirt cheap and quite essential in every lab, I have a lot of it. Next up comes something called sodium carbonate, which will help build the cages and further stabilize the trisulfur ions, like sulfur, it's a necessity in every lab, and since it's closely related to baking soda, it makes this whole thing more connected to baking than it should be. As the third ingredient, I am going to need some carbon, which will also aid in the formation of the blue color, and for that I just use some store-bought activated charcoal. The only other, and at the same time most important ingredient I am going to need, is something that will create the aluminosilicate cages needed to house the trisulfur ions, and this something is a certain type of clay called kaolin. While all the other ingredients serve mainly to create and manipulate the trisulfur ions, the kaolin should have almost everything required to make the cages and you would think that something so atomically complex is rare or expensive, but as is the case with all the other ingredients on this list, it's actually really abundant and dirt cheap. I managed to buy a bunch of it online, and while for me it's the only way to get it, in some parts of the world it can just casually lay on the ground. It looks like some average rocks and feels quite oily to the touch for some reason. It also has quite a few uses in many areas of science, all of which combined with it supposedly being edible make it by far the weirdest ingredient on this list. Before using it to make my ultramarine, I first have to lightly process it since these rocks have just been mined from the ground and they are nowhere near laboratory standards. The first thing I want to do is grind them down into a powder so that they have more surface area, and this shouldn't be that hard since they are all quite soft and crumbly. To start, I weight out 150 grams of my kaolin to use for this whole process, and before making it into a powder, I had to lightly dry it so that its moisture doesn't make it stick to my grinder. I first ground all the rocks just a little in my mortar, and to dry them put everything into my lab oven for a few hours. When I came back, the ground rocks didn't look any different than before, but were now bone dry and to grind them into rock flour, I had to use my legendary ball mill. This thing has already appeared in many of my videos and is a product of my dad's top tier engineering skills. It works by smashing something you want to grind against big metal balls inside of a spinning coffee can. To start it up, I got all my dry kaolin into one of my modified coffee cans filled with a few steel balls, sealed it up, got it onto the mill, and while getting my ears destroyed by its loud noises, left it to work for two days. When the two days were up, I got the can of the mill and opened it up to reveal some beautiful rock dust, which was exactly what I hoped to see. Now, the final thing I need to do to my kaolin to make it suitable for making some ultramarine is firing it in a furnace at high temperature to drive off all the water from it. That's because later on, when making the ultramarine, any water contamination will completely screw things up, and to start the drying process, I got 50 grams of my milled kaolin into this cute ceramic crucible. I didn't want to use the whole 150 grams all at once, since one 50 gram batch takes a while to complete, and I figured that if I later needed more, I would just run this step again. 
Anyway, with my Keolin neatly in the crucible, now it's time to bring out my almighty electric furnace which somehow still works after being used aggressively for a long time. It can reach temperatures up to 1200 degrees celsius which will be more than enough for this project and to dry my Keolin I put the loaded crucible into it and set the temperature to 600 degrees celsius. I then let the furnace slowly warm up and maintain the temperature for about 10 hours. During this process the kaolin not only gets rid of all residual water, but its structure also starts to drastically change from a very organized sheet-like one to a more random amorphous one. This change is due to the loss of hydroxyl ions in the atomic sheets of kaolin and the product of this whole endeavor is something called meta kaolin which you can think of as remnants of a building that can be easily rebuilt into many things. Anyway, when the 10 hours were up, I let the furnace cool down and retrieved my crucible. The kaolin now took on a little darker shade and was much fluffier, confirming that something in its structure changed. I waited and it turned out that a total of 6.5 grams of water were lost, which was a really good indicator of the step's success. Now with my meta kaolin ready, I can finally start making some ultramarine and for that I have to first weigh out and mix the ingredients. This is where things get really tricky since the ingredient preparation part is by far the easiest of the two and mixing them is something I have tried to perfect for a very long time. You see, there are dozens of papers, websites and references on how to make synthetic ultramarine and I've actually tried most of them, never getting good results. I literally spent a month of active work trying different ratios and ways of mixing and firing the ingredients, but most of what I ended up with were just some sad grey or black powders. After what felt like an eternity, I finally managed to get some acceptable results and came up with quite a complicated recipe for my ultramarine, which does in fact bear a striking resemblance to baking a good cake. First and most importantly, the ingredients have to be high quality for the process to work at all. For example, the kaolin has to be freshly fired so that it doesn't absorb water from the air for too long, it also absolutely has to have low iron levels, and my one fortunately fits all these criteria. The sulfur carbon and sodium carbonate also have to be dried in an oven, and the first step I have to take in making ultramarine is weighing out 12.5 grams of meta kaolin, 12.5 grams of anhydrous sodium carbonate, 7.5 grams of sulfur, and 1.5 grams of activated charcoal. Now they all have to be combined and ground together in a mortar, this step is also really important with the evenness of mixing the ingredients affecting many factors of the final product. After grinding the hell out of this powder I was left with some smooth grey dust which in theory is just one step away from becoming ultramarine but through dozens of tests I found that if it's first pelletized the ultramarine turns out much better. The best thing to use for pelletizing something is a specialized hydraulic press but since I don't have the money to buy one and this is amateur chemistry I came up with this genius pelletization station that makes use of a dismantled syringe and a hammer. Operating it is really tricky and it took me a good while to get the hang of it, this whole contraption actually works quite well, allowing me to produce a crucible full of small delicate pellets ready to be used in the next step. Speaking of it, now it's time to bake this pelletized mineral flour and for that I again have to use my electric furnace because the needed temperatures are quite high. Before putting in my pellets though, I first have to preheat the furnace to about 750 degrees celsius and you can see me setting the furnace to just 700 which is because its display is lying and the actual temperature inside the furnace is always a little higher which I of course learned the hard way. Anyway, when the furnace warmed up, it was now time to get the pellet crucible into it, which is always a little tricky since I also had to quickly seal it with a lid and try to not set my hair on fire. Fortunately, this time everything went smoothly and with the crucible in place, I closed the furnace and left it to do its thing for 4 hours. Now, nobody knows exactly what happens in this firing step, but among the things that we do know is that sodium carbonate reacts with sulfur in the presence of carbon to form sodium polysulfides which are really sensitive to oxygen and water and they are the reason why the reagents have to be dry and the oxygen access cut off by a lid. Apart from the polysulfide formation, the meta also assembles into those big cages and surrounds the sodium polysulfides forming the core structure of ultramarine. 
Even though the structure is there, the final product won't yet be blue since there are no trisulfur ions present. To create them, some special conditions must be fulfilled and I will create those in the next step known as the oxidation firing that is the opposite of this one which is called a reduction firing. Anyway, when the 4 hours were up, now it was time for the oxidation firing and to carry it out, the first step was to bring the temperature down to about 450 degrees Celsius. I did that by setting my furnace temperature to 400 degrees Celsius and waiting like an hour. When the temperature stabilized, now it was time to take a look at my product. Having done this so many times, I knew that this was the moment of truth where I can easily judge how successful this run is because if the product is in green, it means that I screwed up somewhere. When I lifted the lid from the crucible, I was really pleased to see some dark green pellets which the camera didn't capture too well and with this good news I could now finish turning this thing into ultramarine. For that I need to selectively oxidize the created polysulfides into the trisulfur ions and that is best done using sulfur dioxide gas which I decided to make on the spot by dropping in 3.8 grams of sulfur into the crucible. It all quickly ignited due to the heat producing copious amounts of the deadly sulfur dioxide which is the reason I did this whole thing in my fume hood. To allow the sulfur dioxide to turn all the polysulfides into trisulfur ions, I left this whole thing for about 2 hours in open air and if I hadn't pelletized my powder earlier, this time would probably have been way longer since the sulfur dioxide would have a hard time reaching into the deeper parts of the crucible. Anyway, after the 2 hours, I turned the furnace off and allowed everything to cool down, I then got the still quite hot crucible into a brick and I was just amazed by how well this whole thing turned out. This was the best run I ever did by far, with the pellets having an amazingly vibrant blue color. A month of failures and doubts finally paid off and even to this day I can't really wrap my mind around how a random rock and a few basic chemicals can be alchemically transmuted into this beautiful pigment with such a complex molecular structure. Anyway, I got the pellets out of the crucible and ground them into a fine powder using my mortar and pestle. This powder had an even better color than the pellets, I also weighed it and it turned out that I managed to make nearly 19 grams of some beautiful synthetic ultramarine. Now, before making it into paint and doing some art with it, I wanted to test out some of its properties. I got a small amount of it into a watch glass and as the first test blasted it with a blowtorch, it should be quite temperature resistant but I guess that pretty much every pigment fades away at blowtorch temperatures. Synthetic ultramarine is also supposed to not fade away over time which is one of its many prized qualities, however even something so tough always has a weak point. When it comes to ultramarine blue, this weak point is practically any acid that upon contact immediately bleaches it and creates the deadly hydrogen sulfide gas. Anyway, making this thing into paint is actually quite easy and to do that I got a few grams of my pigment into a mortar and ground it for a few minutes to turn it into some ultra fine blue flower. To turn it into some crude oil paint the only other thing needed is linseed oil which is just some extra fancy vegetable oil and it will soak into my pigment making it into paint. I got a few drops of it into the mortar and just this was enough to make most of the ultramarine clump together and get a much more intense color. This new color made the already vivid powder look almost white and it honestly was one of the most beautiful blues I have ever seen. Anyway, I continued adding the oil until the paint reached a good consistency. Also, since there was a really small amount of it and it was really intense, I added in some calcium carbonate as a colorless filler which together with more linseed oil created a good amount of blue paint ready to be used for painting. I got it all into a vial which was a real struggle and now I could finally start painting something, however having just one paint didn't seem quite right. I wanted to expand my homemade color palette a bit, so I also made some white and black paints using zinc oxide and activated charcoal. Now, with three paints to work with, my arsenal looked a bit better, but I still wanted to have at least one more color. At first, I wasn't really sure what I should use for it, but then I remembered about the green face of the ultramarine palettes and figured I could use them to make some paint. To get them, I just repeated all the steps necessary to make the yellow pellets, which took quite a while because they had to use fresh metakaolin, but when I was done, I was now ready to make some green paint. I loaded the crucible into the furnace just like before, and when the 4 hours of baking were up, instead of removing the lid and adding sulfur, I turned off the furnace and let this thing slowly cool down overnight. 
When I came back, it was time to see how this run turned out, and when I removed the lid, it looked as if the pellets were blue again. However, this is just because some oxygen managed to sneak in and oxidize their outer layer, hopefully leaving their insides untouched. When I got the pellets into my mortar and ground them up, I was really pleased to see a beautiful shade of green emerge, which told me that this run was a smashing success. Now, before turning this powder into paint, I had to wash it with some water, since unlike ultramarine blue, this green stuff still has a ton of free polysulfides which can break down and dissolve in contact with water, and make this thing too reactive to be used as paint. To wash my product, I got it all into a beaker and poured in an arbitrary amount of hot distilled water, I then stirred this mixture around and vacuum filtered out all the now weirdly green water. I then dried the product in my lab oven to yield some incredibly nice and fluffy green dust, perfect for making paint. I treated it the exact same way as all the other pigments to make it into a good bit of some designer paint, and now with my whole squad assembled and DIY instincts fulfilled, it's time to make some art. For that, I went and got a white background and some brushes that I bought a while ago for the Manganese Violet project, and when everything was ready, I unleashed my creative powers. Considering that this is literally the first painting I ever made, I am quite proud of it, even if it looks like the work of a third grader. The original goal was to paint a beautiful seashore like in these YouTube tutorials, but I somehow managed to paint some unknown flag. To paint this questionable seashore, I used my blue and green paint for the sea and the sky, and for the beach I quickly mixed up some paint from the fire at Kaolin, which ended up looking quite nice. I think that I still have quite a long way to go before making some actual art, but we all have to start somewhere. Also, this project was quite a cool one, with Minecraft inspiring me to, through a process that has a striking resemblance to baking, turn some rocks into a brilliant blue pigment that in the past I could purchase a village with. Anyway, I have to thank you all for watching this really amazing project. If you enjoyed it, you can like this video, share it with a friend and subscribe to my channel. If you want to further support my work and gain access to exclusive content unsuitable for YouTube, as well as having your name displayed at the end of every video, I invite you to join my Patreon. Also, as always, a gigantic thank you goes to all my wonderful Patreon members for allowing me to take on all these projects through their generous support, and see you guys in the next video.